bake it. Um, I always get a bunch of emails right before an event that people had to jump into a meeting or do something else and they want to make sure that we record it. Um, okay, let me, uh, let me run through a few housekeeping items. If this is your first time or if you need a reminder, um, we took a little break there with Labor Day. Um, so, uh, but we're back in action with a great September. Um, so today the, the topic is vaccinations and uh, couldn't be a better year or time to talk about that for our clients, for ourselves, for our families. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. I, I really want to recognize our, uh, our um, first monthly sponsor of these digital discussions, which is um, Inspir Inspirations Assisted Living and Memory Care. And you're gonna get to meet them here uh, shortly. But um, let's, let's go through some housekeeping items here. So first is chat. Um, so uh, chat, which you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat icon. This is where, this is sort of like the business card exchange for these meetings. This is where you can type in your information and share resources. Um, it's great to make connections with other attendees. We always have such a wealth of knowledge in our audience. Um, and uh, chat is where you make that happen. Now, the important thing is, as you can see on my screen here, when you use chat, you wanna make sure that you are selecting the dropdown panel, panel all panelists and attendees. Otherwise, it just goes to um, just goes to me and the other panel members. So uh, make sure you use chat and introduce yourself there. The second thing is how do you ask questions and make comments uh, during our time together? And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. The first is is that you can raise your hand. So again, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little raise hand icon. You can raise your hand uh, when we're in sort of Q&A mode and you can verbally uh, share your question or comment. The good news is, doesn't matter what your hair and makeup looks like today, we'll only see your, uh, we'll only hear your voice, we won't see your image, unless you really want to be on with your image, it, which we can gladly accommodate. Um, the second way, and is probably the easiest and most convenient to ask questions or make comments today, is to use the icon next to the uh, raise hand button for Q&A. So for example, today when our speaker is talking, she could be five minutes out of the gate and um, you come up with a question. That's a great time to just type it in and we'll address it as soon as we can during the presentation, okay? And lastly, I like to just share with folks sort of some screen navigation tips. So up in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see that you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view, figure out which one works the best for you. The other thing is, is that people sometimes get frustrated when chat really starts going in a presentation. If you just click on the chat box, it'll, you'll minimize it. All right, uh, proaging.com is where you, you find all these events and you can connect with our community. Um, and our expert today is gonna to be em Emily Shoemaker. But before we get to Emily, I have some special guests that I wanna welcome. Uh, so let me stop sharing my screen. The first guest that I wanna welcome is Robin Hennock. And then we're gonna um, meet Casey and Ben of inspiration. So I want those guys to be on deck. But, uh, but before we do that, I want, to, I want you to meet Robin Hennock of Grows. And um, Robin is the uh, president of Grows and they're our partner on some of these events. In addition, Positive Aging Sourcebook is really partnering in a very meaningful way this year with um, Grows in creating a complete directory of the Grows members in our DC, Maryland, Virginia source book. So uh, Robin, just briefly tell the audience about Grows. We have, uh, we have a lot of Grows members that signed up today, but we have a lot of non-members too. So, thank you, Steve. You know, we're really excited about the partnership because 
we can bring more um, educational events to our community. But for those people who don't know Groves, we provide networking education and advocacy for senior serving professionals in Montgomery County. So, you know, thank you to all the Groves members who are here today. But if you're not a Groves member, definitely consider joining us because we are able to do some really exciting things in the future with this new partnership. Awesome. Um, great. And, and Robin, if you don't mind, just, uh, I know Gloria's in the audience too, just type the link to Grows in the uh, chat box so people can click on and join and, and hopefully get in that, um, that directory. So um, thanks for being here. And uh, I'm going to put you back behind the curtain and uh, we'll get to um, Casey and Ben. Um, all right. All right. I am super excited about our next guests because um, they are our very first digital discussion um, sponsors. And um, basically, just to give you guys some insight, uh, my goal when we started th these digital discussions when COVID-19 broke was to sort of build um, well, I, I didn't really have a goal. We were just trying to connect the community. And looking back six months later, we've really built a great forum for providers to connect with each other, to learn from each other, and what have you. Now, obviously, in an effort to keep this sustainable, we'd love to have sponsors, but we didn't want to uh, look at that lightly. And so when you sponsor, you sponsor for the whole month. And we want, we work closely with the sponsors to get creative. Now, uh, in, Inspirations Assisted Living and Memory Care made it super easy because they've got a commitment to um, some really creative projects. And one that I love is animals in their assisted living residence. So I want to introduce you to Ben Casey, a resident and, and, and a special guest today. Um, so, hey guys. Um, Hey, hey, how are you? Great. Uh, so, okay, so first off, which one's Ben and which one's uh, Casey? So the audience knows. That's, Hi, that's I'm Ben Swayle. Okay. And I'm Casey Troyer. And this is Margaret. Uh, hey, Margaret. Margaret. Yeah. And we're showing. And <laughs> and what we uh, have are three locations. We're in Linthicum right now. We have three locations, 80 units. We consist of five small 16 unit buildings on three locations, Westminster, Lutherville, and Linthicum. And we try to bring people new purpose and see what lights them up and brings them joy. And animals are a big part of that. They're one of the things we brought with us after being consultants for 30 years using best practices. So we'd love to introduce you to our little chicken here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so cute. How old? So this guy is about four weeks old. They, uh, mm -hmm. they grow really quickly. As you can see from when they're little chicks with the yellow feathers and they, uh, they shed those. And this guy is getting into almost adolescent age, about five or six weeks. And they're full grown by about 12 to 16 weeks. Yeah, oh, amazing. And one of the, one of the things that uh, for the audience, we're going to have Ben and Casey back on uh, once a week. At, so they'll be back at a session next week. And we're going to get to meet another animal at, from the Inspirations family. Who, who are we going to be meeting next week? You uh, know? We'll probably be meeting our alpacas in Westminster. Wow. Alpacas. And what are some of the other animals that you have in your communities? We have uh, alpacas, we have goats, we have some saltwater and freshwater aquariums, we have aviaries with various colored finches, um, and we're always adding adding more, so Great. it's quite fun with residents. They love this, this is Here's amazing. Here's the mother and her chicks. Oh, wow, look at that. Oh, so cool. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, 
your name is very uh, fitting because you're an inspiration to all of us to think creatively about how we can make our, our senior living settings more unique and, and innovative. Uh, hats off to you guys. There's so much that can be done. We're happy to share what we've learned. We've seen 30, in my 30 years at consulting, we've seen thousands of buildings. So we've seen maybe five or 10% that are really, uh, really hitting the target of what could be done. So very few, but we're taking those with us and created our own platform to bring those best practices to residents. I love it. I'll make sure to put your contact information in chat for anybody that wants to reach out to you directly. But uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week and meeting the alpaca. Okay, thank you. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. And thanks, Margaret. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Margaret, for joining. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Th thank you. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> Video and mute. Okay. That was a special treat. Okay. All right. Well, now we got another special treat, our program. And I'm going to bring Emily Shoemaker on. And um, Emily, Hi. great. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. E excellent. All right. Well, I, uh, I met Emily just a few weeks ago, uh, an attendee of one of our many events, uh, reached out and said, you got to do something on vaccines as we move into flu season, and uh, especially in, in light of where we're at. And they introduced me to Emily, who is um, an expert in this area, but also an entrepreneur. Um, Emily, tell 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 the audience a little bit about your career path and what you're doing now, and then we'll get into the topic at hand. I um, well, first of all, thanks for having me, and um, it's good to be here with the the group. But um, I wanted to initially, I graduated from pharmacy school and. Um, I came up here, being a Florida native, I came up here and did a residency at Children's in D.C. So that, that's what brought me to the Maryland, um, D.C. area. And, um, and after residency, I was, um, I was a manager um, for about 13 years um, at a retail and an independent pharmacy. And I just, one of the things that really stood out in throughout those, you know, almost 14 years was, um, you know, vaccinations and how the pharmacy profession has changed and allowed us to bring that um, and expanded to um, provide vaccinations. Excellent. And so now from the, um, from the uh, uh, entrepreneurial perspective, you are a, um, you started this, this unique business uh, that's very unique to the, to the area. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's, um, it, it's unique in the fact that it's the first of its kind. It's the first, um, I guess, mobile vaccination pharmacy um, where I solely focus on vaccinations. That is the sole um, permitted uh, activity of this pharmacy. And it's one that I, you know, given, given especially in light of, of what we're experiencing right now, um, being able to provide the one thing that people can do for themselves and bring it to them instead of them always having to come to us and allowing, um, allowing that, um, those barriers to be overcome just for mere um, convenience. Great. Yeah, and so um, this is fantastic. Uh, I, I'm really excited about your your new venture, and I think it's very relevant. Um, I, I sort of feel like you you it might have been like insider training starting this business because <laughs> you can see how with the course of events how a, a year or two from now um, you're going to be a very busy person. Let's keep our fingers crossed doing COVID vaccinations as well. 
But, um, but really what we're talking about today is what we can do right now for our clients and for our families and for us as individuals as it relates to vaccinations. I, I imagine the bulk of what you're gonna talk about is the flu vaccine um, and, and tips and guidance that we can give to, to those around us to, um, to be as safe and as healthy as possible. So um, uh, what I'm gonna do, Emily, if it's okay with you, is I'm gonna drop off the screen, but um, I will jump in and um, interrupt you uh, if we have any relevant questions. Um, the, uh, and what I would say to the audience is, Emily is open to answering questions throughout her presentation. So I urge you to, as questions come up, just type your questions in to the uh, Q&A box um, and let's see, um, actually, and, and I'm just gonna do this just as a purpose of an example. Catherine McCallum has raised her hand. You can also ask a question verbally. So I'm gonna allow, uh, oh, no, her, her hand has gone down. People are playing around with that. So, so let's just get started with the presentation. Type your questions in um, and uh, Emily, just be prepared for when you pause, I may ask, a, I may reference some of the questions. So okay. you can go ahead and share your screen now and okay. um, I'll drop behind the curtain. Let's see. And yeah, let's see. So yeah, share screen down there at the bottom. Oh, got it. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, this is funny, and I hope the inspiration guys are on on the call st still. Cassandra Key chimes in: "Are animals being tested also?" <laughs> so, uh, well, um, this is but, uh, this kind of describes the the journey I've been on to become the uh, entrepreneur that I have become, but not not exactly quite the theme I was, you know angling for but needless to say um but for those of you who can't um who, this is a little hard to read it is kind of small but slowly he would cruise the neighborhood waiting for that occasional careless child who confused him with another vendor so <laughs> i love anyway. it so anyway so vaccines in the COVID era um we're gonna, um, I wanted to kind of just throw this out here because a lot of people, um, at least it was it was news for me as to, um, you know, where did the first vaccine come from and who was actually the first, um, you know, the first people to receive the vaccine. Um, I think you wanna, we're taking a poll to see. Yeah, I, I, I put it up there and uh, let's see, it's usually, I usually wait till we get to 50% uh, response and we're getting close. And uh, let's see here, we're getting close and we're almost there. And then I'll reveal the, re the, the results. We'll see if our audience knows the right answer. Okay, so here is the, uh, the results. Emily, did they get it right? Yes, they did. <laughs> so um, it was in the 1940s that the um, U.S. military um, was given the vaccine for, um, and it was used during the uh, Second World War. So just a little um, fun fact for you. Oh, let me get this. So this is a, just to kind of give you how far um, things have come. If you look to the right over here on the screen, if you could imagine being injected by that contraption now, I don't think anybody would get vaccines either. <laughs> so, um, so how do vaccines work? Well, it's usually a weak or a dead form of the germ is introduced into the body and it creates a memory of um, memory, a group of memory cells, BNT cells 
that uh, creates a, uh, a memory, for lack of a better term, um, so that when the virus is introduced again, the body recognizes it as something something familiar and it actually and it takes care of it 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 um it um helps eradicate the um the vac or the 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 bug um or the germ and the imitation of what the transition period from the time that the vaccine this this a uh, small amount of germ is entered into the body and the time it takes for that the memory to uh, to develop is a few weeks which is um, and we'll get into later that feeds into the timing of why vaccine why there is certain times that vaccines are um, I ideal times for vaccines to be given so um, and that's the period of time when um, the transition period from when the vaccine has been given to the time that that the memory cells have been created is there's there's a lag time in there and sometimes we acquire uh, we acquire germs or um or diseases during that time and so when you get the after you get the vaccine and you get sick a lot of people think oh well the flu vaccine caused me to get sick well it's probably during that transition period when you were exposed to um another um another bug or another uh pathogen that uh that it's finally showing symptoms and it's finally um coming you know surfacing so um What's the what's in a vaccine? Well, the vaccine strains that that are uh, in the flu vaccines for this year, um, there's um, egg based and then there's cell culture based. And most all of the vaccines this year are quadrivalent. Uh, there is one, I think, one or two that are still the trivalent. But these are the specific uh, vaccine virus strains that are in the vaccines this year. You've got your H1N1, H3N2, uh, the Victoria and Yamagata lineage. So it's the Yamagata lineage that distinguishes a trivalent versus a quadrivalent. And then the same for the cell culture. It's just, it's more, it's just based on, um, it's a cell derivative versus the egg proteins that are used to develop the vaccine. The other, uh, the other ingredients that are in vaccines are preservatives. Uh, thermosol, which is the one um, that has been most, uh, that has been most uh, talked about, especially in the, um, in the pediatric uh, world, is um, it's a, it, it's added to prevent contamination. Um, of the vaccine and it's it, and it's used in the production so uh, and it's only put in in the multi-dose vials so a lot of the a lot of the vaccines that are given now are in the pre-filled syringes and those are without the without made without preservatives but the form of thermosol that is used is the ethyl mercury versus the methyl mercury which is the one that has been shown to be toxic the adjuvants, uh, the aluminum. I know this is another um, another concern, or I guess it raises um, some red flags. But um, it's it's to allow for the you. This is used as an adjuvant, which um, boosts the immune response to uh, the virus. And here, it allows for the for the use of less antigen. So you have like. Um, and we'll talk later too about the two different vaccines and I'll get more into that. Um, and they, in adjuvants, it seems like a fairly new term, but it's been used for over 70 years. And it's actually one of the most common metals found in nature. Um, and to kind of uh, give you a little bit of perspective as far as the amount of aluminum, uh, children get more aluminum through, or babies get more aluminum through breast milk and formula than they do 
um, in, in what's the little residual left over in, um, or the residual, I mean, I'm sorry, the amount of aluminum that's in the vaccines. Uh, stabilizers, sugars, and gelatin, that's uh, to improve the efficacy of the vaccine so that it can maintain a shelf life. Um, the residual cell culture materials and the egg proteins, uh, they are used to specifically grow the, the grow the vac create the bacteria, um, or to grow the bacteria to create the vaccine. In the, um, and that's the, the medium that is used for the egg base. That's why they call them egg based. Hey, um, um, yeah. uh, Emily, um, yeah. Tiffany Oscar has a question. Uh, how does the patient know if the vaccine is, L is cell versus egg based? Um, there, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna get to like the, the different um, where they fall. But most all of them, there's only, um, I think there's only one regular vaccine, like re standard dose vaccine that is cell cultured, and that is the flu cell vax. Okay. And I'll, um, I will, I will touch on that. You'll, I will, you'll see that later. But most of them are egg based, egg from the egg protein. Okay, great. And then Joe has a couple of good questions, but I think you're going to address them here shortly. But um, for everybody in the audience, feel free to type in your questions as they come to you and we'll make sure to address them. So the, uh, there's also um, the formaldehyde um, ish, the formaldehyde that is in these vaccines is, is an inactivating ingredient. It kills the viruses and it inactivates the, the toxins that are present in the in vaccines. And there is a tiny amount left over in the vaccine, in the, in the production of the vaccines. And formaldehyde also is something that, that is in the bloodstream in very tiny amounts as well. And the amount that's in the vaccine is less than what is what usually circulates in our bloodstreams. And then the little bit of uh, then there's also a residual uh, amount of neomycin, which is used to prevent contamination of the bacteria during the manufacturing process. The safety of vaccines. I'm just going to briefly, you know, let you look at this. It's Safety is built into the vaccination uh, process, the vaccination life cycle or the process of vaccine development pretty much every step of the way. As you can see, there's, there are, are different applications and different uh, approval, um, approval, I guess, organ or groups that um, that are involved in the approval process to get a vaccine to market. And each, each one, I mean, as you can see right out of the gate, just in the basic research and the discovery, safety is, is already built in right at the beginning in phase one and then the effectiveness. And then again, in phase three, it's how all of that comes together. And all of that is reviewed extensively uh, in the advisory committees. So this is, I mean, we've come a long way, as you can tell from the big, the, the contraption that they were using back then to, to now. So it, it's come a long way. So getting back to uh, the question earlier, um, this is kind of a, this is just a skim, uh, an inner overview of the uh, quadrivalent and uh, which which vaccines uh, manufacturers uh, which which um, I'm sorry the menu the market the marketed uh, vaccines that are fit into each one of these categories you have the inactivated flu um, influenza vaccine, which is your Fluria, Flulaval, Fluorix, and Fluzone. Those are all egg-based. There is one live attenuated vaccine, and that is the one that, um, that is 
that you have to be more careful with in administering that. And that's where if you're feeling sick or have any uh, symptoms of pretty much any other than maybe the cold, you would not, you would want to uh, defer uh, vaccination used in that from that using the live attenuated version. There is a recombinant vaccine, uh, quadrivalent flu block, flu cell vax, which is the one that I referred to earlier, is this is the one uh, cell cultured based vaccine. Uh, and then you've got two adjuvanted egg based vaccines. One is there's a fluad trivalent and then there's a fluad quadrivalent, which is the quadrivalent is new for this year. And so that has the, um, the adjuvant. Um, there's a specific adjuvant that is added to that. And then you've got your high dose, which is more probably what this group is more uh, familiar with as far as uh, the, they're in their communities. And so that's the flu dose, the flu zone high dose. So five important things to know about vaccines in the aging population. One, it's very, very, very important, especially in, in this population due to um, immunosenescence. Immunosenescence is a decline in both the, um, the level of adaptive and innate immunity that, we, that you and I have, but it decreases with age and therefore increases susceptibility of, to disease and therefore um, increasing hospitalizations and deaths. And historically, this population, the aging population of 65 years and older, is re they represent 50 to 70% of the influenza-related hospitalizations and 70 to 85 percent of influenza related deaths. Vaccines, the specific vaccines that are indicated, um, the high dose vaccine, which is the flu zone high, high dose quadrivalent, this is more, it's 24 percent more effective than the flu zone standard dose and due to the fact that it contains more hemagglutinin uh, than the standard, uh, than the standard flu vaccine. Sorry, um, and this it does. I'm not sure if you all have noticed, but it it, it is a 0.7 mL versus a, a half mL um, dose. So it do, it is a slightly larger um, volume dose. And the most common um, effects are usually um, at the injection site and the pain and um, a little bit of um, myalgia associated with that. Um, the fluid quadrivalent is, this is the adjuvanted uh, vaccine that I was speaking about, or the, this is the one that I was referring to. And the adjuvant that is used for the fluid quadrivalent and is indicated specifically for 65 years and older, uh, that population, it contains a, um, an adjuvant MF59, which is a squalene oil and water emulsion. And it, what it does is it, it stimulates the, it allows the antigen, the normal amount of antigen to work better. And it creates or stimulates a higher immune response than the standard dose. And it, this is a half half ml dose as well and pretty much the same um, adverse effects and usually these these add the redness and swelling and the pain at the injection site goes away within one to three days so the the magic question every year is okay when is the ideal time to receive the flu vaccine it's usually september and october but they also uh, recommend vaccinations or they want people to vaccinate later as long as the, um, you know, as long as it, the virus is circulating. And it usually is well into the beginning of, of um, like January and sometimes February, but usually by January. Um, and 
the reason for September and October is a vaccination prior to September, it's too early. So, and what happens is later in the season, you may see that level of protection drop off a little bit. And so getting it right before uh, the right before the virus peaks, which is usually October, November, November, well, actually mid-November, December, usually, but it, it differs every year. Um, they, the best time to do it is a couple weeks prior. You, when I mentioned earlier about the, the transition time of the production of those memory B cells and T cells, uh, that they want to allow enough time before the virus circulates too much and we get infected before the uh, vaccine is, is, is considered um, effective enough to fight it off. And specifically this year, the flu-COVID combo, the factors that are affecting the co-infection risk is, um, I mean, lack of, lack of reporting because of the social distancing and the people and the population is really just, they're, they're scared to go into the doctor's offices um, for their appointments. And avoidance of the flu vaccine is another one. And then pre-existing comorbidities um, can also affect, um, increase risk substantially of co-infection. Co and obviously the factors that would reduce that are, yes, if you social distance, if you wear a face mask and, um, you know, less influenza would be, could be circulating, but it, it's really, really hard to know. The one thing, I, the one thing that is, is known and is highly, highly, highly recommended this year is get the flu vaccine. It, it, you will do more for yourself by doing that than, um, than um, if you didn't. So when this, and this is what I'll um, conclude with, and then I'll be happy to answer questions, is um, in this COVID era, how often do we have a chance to make a difference in other people's lives? If you have grandchildren, if you have uh, fr friends or family members that are older or have comorbidities, if you know a healthcare worker, you know how the healthcare system has been affected this year. Um, vaccinate for your own health and for the ones around you, for the loved ones around you. And obviously <laughs> get vaccinated against the flu. Um, and this is, again, a little bit of, of humor, but um, <laughs> I said, have you had your flu shot? And I guess he's not going to get on the boat if he hasn't. <laughs> um, and think of getting your flu shot as installing virus protection software instead of just getting shot. Man, yeah. this is great, Emily. Thank you for that very thorough overview. And we got a ton of really good questions here. And so um, I would say to the audience, um, I'm gonna start ripping through these questions, but if you'd prefer to um, uh, at, make a comment or ask a question uh, verbally, just uh, simply raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll call on you. And you raise your hand by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen there. But let's start at the top here. Joe Sperling has a couple, Several really good questions. I'm going to leave them out until. Whoops. Um, and uh, it's uh, when when should those of us over 65 get the flu shot? Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it b before the end of October. It's I mean you can do it now. Um, you can you can certainly do it now. Vaccines okay. are available. Um, I know I received my first shipment a couple, um, probably about a week and a half ago. So they are circulating and the vaccines are available. Okay. And then Joe also says, and this is a really good question that I'm curious about is, does it matter where we get the vaccine? Yeah. Doctor's okay. office, pharmacy, or grocery store? It's hard to hear because I think somebody has their, <laughs> I missed that. Yeah. 
Um, let me, this is, this is weird because we've, um, uh, okay. Yeah, we, we've only, that's an interfering, that's the closest we've come to Zoom bombing <laughs> um, in, in six months. So um, yeah, does it matter where we get the vaccine? Your doctor or pharmacy, I mean, really, it's more a matter of getting it. Yes, I would go somewhere where you're familiar. And at the same time, I mean, yeah, definitely get it. And I don't, I really, I don't think it matters. I okay. really don't think it matters. Now, out of curiosity, like, because until you gave this presentation, I just thought there was just one flu vaccine and we all took the same thing. But should we be requesting different, like egg-based versus um, cell-based? Like, and, and is there sort of a difference in the quality that might be provided in a grocery store versus your doctor's office? Um, it's, I mean, the flu, they're all recommended. The, the CDC and the, and the FDA, it, you're going to be hard pressed to, to get them to recommend one over another. They're all, they're all effective and they all work pretty much the same way. It's just how they do it is the difference. And some, and some vaccines may work better in different people than others. I mean, it's, it's really hard. It really is hard to say the egg based. If you, if, if you have an issue with eggs, you know, whether it's an allergy or just a sensitivity to eggs and, and that's, you know, that kind of stigma behind the whole egg thing, then get the cell based. And hmm. the cost of them, the cost of them are not that, that dramatically different. So it essentially it's kind of go with what you, what you feel comfortable with. Will most providers have, um, have both options. So if you've got an egg allergy or something like that, you could request the cell uh, based. I would think most of the doctor's offices do. I'm not sure about the pharmacies. I know okay. that sometimes the pharmacies, they are, they have like a set formulary or they have a set, um, you know, a set list of the ones that they, that they will stock. Um, it, so yeah. And, um, Rhonda Thomas um, of Care Patrol has a, a good question, and I don't know if you covered it. Why do some people become sick after taking the flu vaccine? Uh, uh, it's hard to, again, it's hard to pinpoint exactly, but that, that period of time that I mentioned in my, in, in early on about how vaccines work and how they, it's that transition period in between the time that they get the vaccine. So they may have been exposed to somebody who was sick or a carrier who had not displayed symptoms or you know, developed symptoms yet to, and they may have picked up on that through respiratory or however in the air even. Um, and then they go and get the vaccine two days later and then they're sick a week and a half later. Well you just got the vaccine and the vaccine has not had a chance to develop that memory that the body develops to combat against that virus. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to call on Catherine McCallum, who actually introduced me to you. She's got her hand raised and, um, whoops. Hey, can uh -huh. you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, Emily, if, you know, one of the things is, um, about offering it that's convenient and safe and cost are in your new business are you available to uh schedule for the vaccine in the next six weeks um at a community center or um what i guess my question is what kind of um place would you go to and what would be the cost particularly for seniors could you talk to that Pretty much, I, I can pretty much go anywhere. And I say anywhere with the exception of people's homes. That is the one, the one, um, I guess the one. Restriction? Exactly, the one restriction on my, uh, my permit for 
my pharmacy permit. So um, community centers, churches, businesses, offices, any, any and all. And yes, I do have, um, I do have vaccine available now. And as far as the seniors, I am a Medicare provider. So there is no out-of-pocket expense for the flu vaccines, the pneumonia vaccines, and the um, hepatitis B vaccines. Okay, thank you. Great, um, thanks. Good question, um, Catherine. And um, let's see, okay. Uh, Joe Sperling, is there a particular type of vaccine recommended for us over the age of 65? When you, when you were talking about all the different mm -hmm. uh, vaccines there, right. it, is, is one okay. better than the other? Well, you're talking about the flu zone high dose versus the flu ad? Yeah. Okay. There's two different schools of thought, and, and it's, a, it, it's a personal preference. However, I will give you the two quick rundowns of how they are made and the kind of the theories behind them. The flu, dose that high do, the flu zone high dose, it's a tongue twister, um, the flu, do, flu zone high dose contains four times more of the hemagglutinin, which is the, the antigen in it, than the a regular standard vaccine. And so from that standpoint, they've chosen to go to more, more is better. Um, as far as we put more in there, it's gonna provide a, a stronger immune response in this population to overcome that immunosenescence um, or that um, immunity decline in this population. The uh, Fluad is another, another, I guess, route, if you will, is what they have done is they have used what I, and as I mentioned earlier, the adjuvant. They've used adjuvants in, um, in many things to help boost the immune system. So the amount of antigen and the amount of, you know, dead virus in the, um, or the inactivated um, virus is the same as the standard, but they've added an adjuvant. And I know that uh, sometimes in, in the, po the older population, they, they request the regular standard dose because they're like, I don't need all of that. You know, I don't need the extra. Well, Fluad, um, the Fluad uh, quadrivalent is the one that has the standard dose. They've just added the adjuvant to help help stimulate the um, or boost the immune system response um, a lot greater, a lot more. Great. Um, Sylvia Balderas has a couple of questions. Um, does the flu shot interfere with a pneumonia or shingle shot? No. And how far apart should the pneumonia or shingle shot be taken after the flu shot? They can be given at the same time. Okay. Now, do you do those two shots? Yes. Yes. Oh, I mean, great. obviously upon, you know, I, I just need to know so I can get it, but yes, I can okay. do all of those. What, um, what are the, the, I mean, in a nutshell, what are some of the vaccinations that you're able to provide? Um, <laughs> all the ones the CDC recommends. Uh, okay. I, how many are there? I'm just out of curiosity. Oh, goodness. Um, that's a good question. I'll have to get back to you on that one. But I mean, hundreds or? Um, I mean, you've got, you've got anywhere from chicken pox to HPV to yellow fever, you know, all the ones for your travel vaccines, your flu vaccines. Wow. I mean, there's probably, yeah, you're probably talking a good 75, 80 maybe. I, I'll, I'll get a number and I'll get back to you on that. Great. No, no, just a more uh, trivial there. Um, Tiffany Oscar says, how long does the vaccination last? It lasts through the flu season, usually about six months, four to six months is what okay. they, is what I've read. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, Christine Toronto uh, says, and you already answered this, can you talk more about vaccine valet side? Are you going into private homes and you, your permit at this time does not permit that? Uh, we have heard of people who are looking to get a flu shot at home. And um, I guess, you, you know, we've featured several doctors on these digital discussions. Um, Dr. DeYoung with Capital Caring 
Dr. Dappen with um, Doc Talker. Um, and these doctors make house calls. So my assumption is do most medical practitioners have the ability to give this flu shot? And if they if they if they're making house calls, would they more than likely have a permit to do these at home? I, that's a really good question, and I'm happy to look into that. I, it is not. I I I know that I'm not permitted to do that. Um, however, as far as a physician doing it, I that's something that's something I would have to look into and I can definitely you know if you yeah. want to send me your email I'll be happy to you know um get yeah, back look, to you on look that. into that and I also will. I'll reach out before I follow up with everyone I'll also reach out to Dr. DeYoung and Dr. Dappen and just see if that's something that they're able to do um uh let's see Ken Silverstein says should there be a certain amount of spacing between getting the second shingle so shot in the flu vaccine, I think you, they need, they don't interfere with each other. Correct. Right, they're both, they're both dead, um, like in, um, inactivated viruses. Okay, um, Joe Sperling says, are you, Emily, doing any vaccines anywhere near Rockville in the near future? And I assume, like if you had a, uh, a senior living community that where you're doing vaccinations for the residents, that they're, that the community, assuming that they had a safe space or what have you, might open that up to uh, other people. Who is is that been done? I um, I'm open to I'm I've pretty much kind of left that up to the to the vin, to the uh, to the vendors or to the people that I um, that I contract with. Okay. Um, I am. My my only re, I guess my only request in in doing outside is knowing just knowing how much vaccine to bring when I come because okay. I need it has to be and obviously right now we're doing it by appointments to allow the social you know the physical distancing and to um, but yeah mainly I mean I'm happy to do any and all and um, I just need to know quantity so I have enough stock to be able to provide. Great. And then uh, Sarah Weaver says, how often should you receive the pneumonia shot? Is it one or two types of shots? There are two types of pneumonia shots. One is the um, is a uh, 13 polysaccharide, which is usually given when you're a child. Um, and then they recommend the um, Pneumovax, which is a 23 polysaccharide. Uh, version that is usually given at, at fifty at fifty or older, um, and I think you only need one of it. You have to wait. You know, if you're if you get it earlier, younger than fifty, they request they re they want you to do they want you to boost or get another a pneumo uh, pneumococcal vaccine after sixty five. Great. And then um, our last typed in question, but certainly, you know, raise your hand if you want to ask an additional question. But Meg McKenna says, what would be the out of pocket expense for under or uninsured folks to get a flu shot? Um, you mean if they were just to pay out of pocket for it? Yeah. Um, yeah. The flu, the for the flu vaccine, the regular flu vaccine is $42. And um, that is, I mean, and that's either the cell, the cell based or the egg based, um, you know, the egg protein based uh, flu vaccine. Okay, great. Now, uh, my question for you that hasn't been addressed is, I would love to hear your personal thoughts on no. this, the, the COVID-19 vaccine and like, as somebody who is in literally in the business of vaccines, what do you sort of see out there and what's your kind of crystal ball prediction on uh, a vaccine for COVID-19? Do you mind repeating that? My daughter came in. And oh, oh, okay. Like I'm, just, I'm just interested in your thoughts on yeah. the COVID-19 
vaccine? Like, what is your what is your sort of crystal ball prediction based on uh, you as a um, professional? Yeah, I I'm confident that there is going to be a vaccine. I know in the last week there has been you know a couple of um, a couple of issues that have come up with that, um, and I look at that as a good thing, as a as a positive, because this is something um, that happens every in every trial that you do. You want you want to find these things out if in fact they you know the the effects or the adverse um, events from uh, doing these trials. You obviously want to know what they are before it comes out into the general public. And uh, so I think as far as, I think we need to continue to be patient and, um, and just, just kind of wait and see what happens because this is not, you know, what, what they have seen is normal in all, in all trials, whether it's a cancer drug, whether it's any of the vaccines that we have spent decades, um, you know, you, developing. It's, um, it's just, it's gonna take time and sometimes, and yes, you obviously want to find these things out before you, you know, throw it out to the masses. Um, it, but, it's also they have to stop and do the studies and it's a safety it's for the safety of of the of the um of the american people and for everybody is mm -hmm. to stop take a step back okay is this really related as far as the covid vaccine coming out it's i would not expect to see it probably before spring and i mean to like the general public everything mm -hmm. that i have heard the healthcare and frontline workers are going to be the ones that are going to have um, priority to it in the beginning so that they can, you know, they can prepare, they can be immunized so that they can help the, you know, everyone else. Well, wow, that's great. And then I guess, you know, I, I heard another speaker talk about this, about, you know, we're so hopeful for this vaccine, but, um, vaccines are never 100%. And um, I think that we're sort of being lulled into this expectation that, oh, once the vaccine is out there, we can just go back to business as usual. But um, any sort of insights on the effectiveness of any of these vaccines that you're um, administering? Well, there, just given history, if you look at yellow fever, you look at measles, you look at um, diphtheria, and you look at some of the, in polio, I mean, you look at some of these diseases that have literally plagued um, generations past, and now they're pretty much eradicated. And it's because of, I mean, obviously there were a couple, you know, we saw a couple measles outbreaks here and there, for the most part, though, that was that was mediated by the fact that we had the vaccine and everybody, most everybody is vaccinated against that. And it keeps it it keeps it at, at bay. And it, you know, yeah, do you want these to become endangered species? Of course you do. Or do you, you know, as far as like even the natural immunity, you obviously do not want to get one of these diseases because if you do, it's it's unbelievable the the toll that it takes on the body and sometimes it doesn't recover so it's definitely <laughs> um i definitely think vaccines are are the way to go and it provides that memory and it allows your body to to take care of um it's just that extra um extra layer of armor i guess you could say yep well, this is fantastic. We are literally perfect timing. Um, it is 12.59. So I thank you so much and congratulations on this new and un unique business. For everybody in the audience, I will share the recording. I will share the chat. I will sh share Emily's contact info, um, as well as remember those cute little chicks at the beginning of the, me the meeting. Next week, when you tune, tune in, we're going to get to meet the alpaca at Inspirations and uh, uh, thank, thank that team 
for um, sponsoring our, our digital discussions this month. Um, I also want to add a little plug for tomorrow at noon. Um, we are going to have a discussion on ageism. And um, Positive Aging Sourcebook is, is going to try to uh, develop an ageism awareness initiative in the spirit of uh, Ashton Applewhite. If any of you are familiar with her, her book, she's created a framework to raise ageism awareness. So I'm really excited about that discussion. So we'll see you guys tomorrow at noon. E Emily, um, thanks so much. And um, make sure that you send me any details and I'll send it out to the, to the whole crew uh, who attended today. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. See you guys tomorrow. <laughs>